All right, modern world history students, here we go. This is a subject that you are uh, somewhat familiar with, the Pearl Harbor attack that happened on December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Uh, of course, that's a famous line uh, stated by the President of the United States the day after the attack. Um, I think I'll tell you some things you knew, uh, you already know about this event, uh, but hopefully, of course, I'll help you, uh, I will tell you some stories you may not know or may not have heard of or thought of. Well, obviously, uh, this is the infamous, <laughs> day of infamy, this is the infamous attack uh, by Japanese uh, naval and air forces on the island of Oahu at Pearl Harbor, uh, which is basically a huge naval base, or was, was and still is. Uh, it was, there was also some attacks at uh, basically Army airfields. There was no such thing as an American Air Force at that time. So uh, certainly the United States had planes, but the uh, men, who flew in, uh, men who flew in planes were either in the Army or they were in the Navy or they were Marines. There was no such thing as an Air Force at that time. So many airfields, however, were also attacked on this particular day. Uh, keep in mind that when you uh, see movies about the uh, Pearl Harbor attack, you will notice that uh, the American flag only has 48 st uh, stars on it. It doesn't have 49, it only has 48. And so uh, that tells us that Hawaii was not an American state yet. Oh, no, It was actually a still an American territory, all right. Uh, it doesn't, be, of course, Hawaii doesn't become a state until 1959. The particular day of the week, I think you may know this already. It was a Sunday, and it happened. The first wave hit about eight in the morning, and it was uh, the the goal of the one of the major goals of the Japanese was to. Uh, have a surprise attack. And that's exactly what they were able to accomplish. It was a surprise. Uh, they made it all the way in to Pearl Harbor, basically undetected. Even though there were clues, <laughs> there were several clues along the way uh, that morning that something was coming, uh, but the American armed forces uh, missed out on those. Okay, so now why, why did they do this? Why did the Japanese uh, attack Pearl Harbor? Well, uh, I think there's, this is something else we can sort of all sort of relate to, and that is that Japan was an island nation. And it had limited, you can make the argument, still, it has limited resources. So, I, you know, we've talked in this course about the Industrial Revolution, and certainly the Industrial Revolution started in England. It's, was in, it really gets going, in, obviously, in Europe and the United States first. Really one of the very first places that was a non-European, non-Western uh, place that tried to industrialize on a massive scale was Japan. And when you, we, we discussed this as well, when a nation decides to industrialize, there are certain things you need. One of which, one of the main things you would need is natural resources. And obviously being an island, um, natural resources are limited. So the Japanese have to uh, trade uh, for a lot of what they needed. And uh, I, I would sort of say that the Japanese uh, did not feel respected as a nation by the West at this particular time. And what happens is, is that the Japanese military uh, becomes super strong and powerful within the country of Japan. And they have a lot of influence. Uh, at this time, Japan is has an emperor. Um, he is a ceremonial head. Uh, he is considered uh, virtually uh, godlike by the Japanese population. Uh, but the military becomes extremely, extremely influential. And they push forward many aggressive um, campaigns against Japan's neighbors. Really, the best example is in China. And many historians look back and they say, well, the uh, Japanese invasion of China is really uh, virtually 10 years before Pearl Harbor, uh, the Japanese invasion of China is really sort of the start of World War II. Many people say this. 
Now, this may sound uh, a sort of uh, similar to something else that you've heard of around this time period. Uh, the, the Japanese were certainly social Darwinists, you could argue, uh, I think, uh, make a good argument. Uh, it certainly is a debatable topic that the uh, Japanese were as influenced by social Darwinism at this time as it was rising through uh, much of the world as anyone. And they believed that uh, there should be a unification, a pan-Asian uh, empire. Um, that might sound sort of familiar to something you've heard before. And this pan-Asian empire in which all Asian people would live together in one empire, of course, would be run, however, by Japanese, uh, the Japanese people. Uh, the, so these, these pan ideas, these uh, great empire ideas certainly are not new. Uh, we see this all the way back throughout time uh, and certainly we should be surprised to see this uh, near our, in, in modern history, how's that sound? Now American interests in the Philippines uh, were a threat to this idea. The United States had been involved in the Philippines. Uh, since the turn of the century, at the end of the Spanish-American War, when really the United States sort of uh, helped the Philippines be freed of the Spanish. Um, the United States had interests and had uh, trade interests, and they had military interests in the Philippines. So the idea of a pan-Asian concept, um, a pan-Asian empire, was threatened by the uh, Americans in the Philippines. And I should probably say, Let's not forget the Dutch, the French, the English are also all over Southeast Asia by this time. Uh, they all want, they, all of those European uh, nations are there. Uh, so what did the Japanese decide? How do we get, how, how can we win a war? How would we be able to win a war against the United States? Well, the idea was, okay, let's, let's try to take them out with one punch. How's that sound? Uh, let's try to win the fight on the first punch. And if we could take out the, the most important parts of the U.S. Navy in one shot, we would demoralize, uh, we would not only defeat their military service, their naval service, their naval, uh, the U.S. naval threat, we would also demoralize the American public. Uh, and they would, uh, they would basically surrender almost immediately. Right, and so this was the idea that was pushed forward through the military uh, hierarchy within the Japanese military itself. The man we should uh, make a note of is this guy. His name was Yamamoto. All right, and let's see if we can find a picture of Yamamoto just briefly here. Here he is. He was the grand planner. He planned the Pearl Harbor attack. He was the one who made the grand strategy. Um, there is some discussion about whether he was really for it in the long run. Did he really think that this one shot knockout punch idea, uh, it may work in the short term, but not the long term. So he, he was actually, edgy. He had, some of his education was in the United States. He understood the United States. All right. So uh, Yamamoto is a very interesting character. When we get to the Battle of, the Mid of the Battle of Midway, we'll see that he was involved in that as well. All right. And look, this is not a unanimous thing. There is not a big uh, uni unified. The, really, the Japanese military is not a hundred percent unified. They uh, they are having arguments with each other, and really, it came down. Uh, there's an element where it was the army versus the navy. Um, and really the army ultimately had the upper hand in that discussion and so they forced things that the Navy may not have necessarily wanted to do. But the fact still remains that the Pearl Harbor attack occurred. There was a particular goal. Yes, I mentioned a moment ago that uh, element of surprise was uh, part of the plan, and, but there was also this idea of, um, there was this idea of taking out the most important parts of the uh, American naval force, and that was the aircraft carriers of the Pacific. Now, if you're not sure what an aircraft carrier is, this is this is basically, I think you probably do, so this is a magazine called Military History, and uh, this is a more modern version 
of an aircraft carrier, and basically it's a floating island and it's a place where planes can take off and land from. Okay, so if you've seen Top Gun and those types of things. Now, again, this one is much more modern than the ones in um, 19, in the 1930s and 1940s, but I just wanna make sure you get the idea. And so these were the, these were the targets, and they felt, uh, the Japanese felt like if they could take out, uh, the, they knew there were three American aircraft carriers, they felt like if they could take those out, ultimately the war would be over very quickly. So what happened on the day of? Well, there were six Japanese airport uh, aircraft carriers that attacked from the north. And they had been at sea for over a week. They were in complete radio silence. They came from the north. Uh, they skirted virtually the Arctic Circle and then turned to... Uh, starboard to the right uh, to the south and sailed directly from the north towards Oahu and the all six aircraft carriers got really really the aircraft carriers the Japanese aircraft carriers were undetected the entire time um, even as they escaped even after the attack as they left there it was never clear where they were but they got within 230 miles of the Hawaiian Island chain they attacked in two waves with 400 planes and it was very interesting, uh, one of the really super interesting parts of this story is the discussion of the mini submarines. These were two-man submarines that the Japanese uh, hoped would be uh, able to literally actually penetrate into the harbor itself. And they hoped that as American ships were trying to set sail to get out of the harbor that they could be uh, torpedoed by these miniature submarines. And that. Uh, that story is very fascinating. If you ever want a sort of subplot to this entire story, you should read about the five miniature submarines that the Japanese employed. The element of surprise was achieved, as I mentioned before. Uh, one of the people you should know about in this is a guy named uh, Fuchida. And Fuchida was a, uh, one of the very well, uh, one of the highest level of pilots that the Japanese Air Force had. And Fuchida was the one who directed the entire operation, uh, really from above. He had a specially marked plane. This is a, he was basically in a high-level bomber. And his specially marked plane, uh, you may be familiar with the Japanese, uh, the red uh, dot, I guess, the red circle uh, uh, that Japanese planes all had on them. Um, you should recognize that. But his special markings were on his tail. Uh, and his special plane had red paint with some uh, yellow on it to designate uh, uh, to designate that he that this was Fuchida's plane. It was really a three-man dive bomber. Uh, most dive bombers for both sides were really two-person planes. He, uh, this one was uh, set up so he could be uh, in in a, the middle seat, I believe he was in, and he could watch the operation, uh, the entire operation from above. Uh, he actually watched both waves. Uh, as I'll mention in a sec, uh, there's a, there was two waves. They, they, here it is. They, uh, it was done in two waves. There was actually a half an hour uh, lull in between the two waves. Uh, and part of this was just strictly logistics. Yes, six aircraft carriers seems like a lot. Um, but uh, I would also say that 400 planes is a really uh, big number. So they couldn't get them all on and off uh, simultaneously to do it all in one wave. Now, when they, uh, the planes returned to the aircraft carriers after the second wave, Fuchida requested a third wave. And he, was, he believed, and probably rightly so, that they have absolutely no, nothing to defend against us. Uh, we could go in there and hit again, no problem. However, his request for a third wave, this is something you may not know, uh, his request for a third wave was turned down. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the uh, older movie, one of the very really first movies uh, that really took on this subject uh, with actors and everything that was called Tora, Tora, Tora. And um, Tora, Tora, Tora was uh, recited by Fuchida, as a matter of fact. He was the one who actually said that. And basically, it was a the code. I believe it means the uh, Torah means tiger. I believe the code. Uh, that's the 
uh, translation. Anyway, that was to indicate we have achieved the element of surprise. But it was actually Fuchida who said that. Maybe you're familiar with that old movie, Tora, Tora, Tora. All right? So, uh, what should we say about this thing? Well, we should sort of note, I think, that uh, without a doubt, you would have to say this is one of the great mastermind uh, accomplishments um, of all of military history to get uh, a huge fleet like that, uh, that close to the enemy, uh, is, is an amazing accomplishment, strictly viewed from a militaristic, a military strategy, tactics. Look, the fact of the matter is, however, that the, uh, I think that it, and again, this is certainly debatable, but I think that you could make the argument that the long-term goals of the Pearl Harbor attack uh, were not met. And the, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the desire was, the hope was that the uh, American public would be uh, disincentivized from fighting back. They would be uh, bummed out and angry and uh, so shocked. In fact, it really uh, revitalized the American public. Maybe you recall, um, maybe you recall uh, when we discussed World War I, the discussion of isolationism, which was a foreign policy belief of the United States before World War I, basically saying, hey, we're not going to get involved. We want to stay isolated from all this business. Well, after World War I, the United States sort of went back to isolationism. Well, this uh, attack uh, changed that very quickly. Uh, it united the American public uh, on Monday uh, the 8th, uh, recruiting stations for all the major uh, military branches were full of full of guys signing up to get uh, to fight the uh, Japanese. Uh, there were 80 ships that were hit at at port uh, in the in the harbor, of which three never returned. Now, of course, the most famous one is the USS Arizona, that was sunk, uh, and 1,177 sailors went down with that ship. So. There are three altogether. I believe it's the Nevada. You can also see that when you go to Pearl Harbor. That actually, uh, you can see that over on the shoreline, actually. The Nevada got underway, was hit, and the captain of the Nevada uh, beached, which basically he purposely ran his ship into onto the ground so it wouldn't sink in the harbor mouth. That was one of the things that was... Uh, yeah, you don't want to sink a ship, and the Japanese did. You don't want to sink a ship in the harbor mouth and block off that harbor. All right? Now, here's something you may not know. As the Americans uh, on the decks of the ships fought back and were firing guns and firing deck guns at the uh, uh, planes overhead, um, this anti-aircraft fire trying to shoot down the planes as they were attacking, uh, these were, uh, as you certainly would imagine, these were not coordinated. And so as men are shooting up into the sky, look, those bullets have to land somewhere, don't they? Well, uh, sometimes they landed in the city. Uh, they landed in the city limits of Honolulu. And there were, uh, you know, they call that friendly fire, but there were American casualties and, and civilian casualties in Honolulu because of the uh, uncoordinated uh, attempts to shoot back at the enemy planes. Those types of protocols have all been uh, uh, very much taken care of in the modern American military. Uh, usually deck guns are locked down. Uh, if a boat is, if a, if a naval ship is in any port anywhere in the world, uh, they will only aim their guns out to sea. Uh, these are all things that the US military took into account after the fact, after the fact of the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, certainly letter D is something you're all aware of, and that is the one of the great, uh, one of the most incredibly uh, important aspects of uh, the Pearl Harbor attack is the reprisals taken against Japanese Americans after the fact. Um, and this is not just Japanese Americans who were living in Hawaii either. These are Japanese Americans that may have been living anywhere in the United States. They were... Uh, in essence, rounded up and put into what were called detainment camps. Uh, I can tell you in the state of Colorado, we had, we had a big detainment camp 
Um, of course, I wasn't alive at the time, but I know the history that we had a big detainment camp in a town called La Junta in southern Colorado. Um, and that would have been, La Junta is not an easy place to live, I can tell you that. Uh, but that's where the, uh, one of the detainment camps was. And so this is one of the, uh, you know, this is one of the black eyes of uh, American history, certainly without a doubt. Uh, you can make an argument that the Japanese ultimately made three mistakes when the attack occurred. All that success, the uh, element of surprise, um, you know, hitting 80 ships, but they really made three mistakes. Okay, so let's go through these. Number one, you attack on a Sunday with the idea, you know, you're really attacking on a Sunday with the idea of hoping that uh, your enemy is unprepared. Sounds like Napoleon, right? Okay, that, and that may, that may have worked. But the argument could also be made uh, is that why would you attack on a day when there's so many sailors, you know so many sailors are gonna be off their boats. They're gonna be on leave. They're gonna be on weekend leave. Even, you know, the, mili- the United States military was at peace on that morning. Uh, why would they be fully, why would the ships be fully loaded with men? You know, you say, well, you wouldn't want to do that because they would be able to fight back. <laughs> True. But the fact remains is if you're attacking like this and going to war, you are trying to kill the enemy. There was not, and, and look, they did that. They killed several thousand Americans. But too many sailors were, prob- were on leave that day, and that was probably a lost opportunity for uh, the Japanese. Number two, did you know that... All those planes and all those ships in Honolulu, in Pearl Harbor, need gas. And there is a big bunch of fuel supply tanks right there. And all the Japanese needed to do was take one fighter plane, and if they just would have strafed the fuel tanks, they would have destroyed the entire Pacific, uh, the entire Pacific fleet's gas supply uh, in one pass, basically. They would, have, they would have blown it all up, and they didn't even touch those things. And so now what is, why, why is this a huge mistake? Well, this is a huge mistake because uh, this allows a much faster recovery, okay? The, a much faster recovery. Speaking of a recovery, do you know what a dry dock is? A dry dock is a, uh, a place where you can take, you can, basically get a ship out of water and repair the hull. Well, obviously you have all of these uh, ships, many of which were sunk, they were raised, uh, and there's ways to do that. And they were put into dry dock, their hulls were fixed so so they could float again. Well, the Japanese did not destroy the American dry docks. This allows all of the the ships that were uh, hit to be fixed in Hawaii. They didn't have to be towed to San Francisco to be uh, repaired. So this is a, this is a huge uh, mistake and error on the part of the Japanese. Okay, so uh, just to sort of give you an idea, uh, let me, I like to sort of point this out. This is a map of the two waves. Um, my uncle, my uncle Phil O'Brien was at uh, Pearl Harbor and the only thing he ever mentioned about it uh, was he said, basically, uh, they came out of the sun. And so what you'll see here is a couple of lines. So here they come, here's the first wave, and they came this way. So you would have to say, okay, the sun is rising over here, and the story goes, and he, he basically, that was, I just, that was very <laughs> amazing when he said that to me. They came out of the sun. And so the idea was is that this would give a few extra seconds to the Japanese pilots to get done what they needed to get done uh, as people would, as uh, sailors on boats and people on the ground would hear planes overhead, they would look towards the sound, but where would they look? Directly into the sun. All right. Uh, Maybe you are familiar with this man right here. This man is named, he's uh, very famous uh, in the movie Pearl Harbor. Uh, he's played, uh, the most recent Pearl Harbor movie, he's played by Cuba Gooding Jr., the actor Cuba Gooding Jr. This man's name is Doris Miller, and he was a cook on uh, one of the vessels. And when the attack happened, his, uh, his ship was under direct attack, 
and he actually manned a uh, machine gun, a deck machine gun, which he probably had very little training on, and he was act he actually shot down a Japanese plane uh, while he was uh, on, while he was fighting back, uh, for which he was awarded a medal. He did not survive the war; he was killed later on in the war. But his name was Doris Miller. And then I guess one other thing I'll sort of show you here: the, these are the types of planes. Okay. These are the types of planes that attacked. So here, let's take a look at these. Uh, these are the um, these are the basically uh, what I would call um, these, this bottom one is a fighter plane. Uh, this one is sort of a dive bomber, but this is their their fighter plane that protected the bombers. You can see that this is sort of a, you can kind of tell when something is a dive bomber because the bomb is sort of smaller. In other words, the plane goes into a dive and then it's so they're diving upon the plane uh, on the ships and they're trying to drop their bomb at the last second and then pull away and then the bomb hits the ship. The first planes that actually went through uh, that attacked were torpedo planes. And so these were low flying. They came in at a low altitude. These guys came in at a high altitude. This guy, these guys came in at low altitudes and they literally dropped a torpedo into the dropped their torpedo into the water, and of course, obviously, the torpedo was live when it hit the water, and it would hopefully slam into its target. Okay, so these were the first ones to go in, and then the big, uh, uh, and they, they were they were pretty big. They were a little bit slower. All right, and then the dive bombers who could get up really good speed uh, from diving from above. All right, that's kind of what, this is kind of what uh, Fuchida's plane was like. And then the fighters sort of came in and they would try to protect the, uh, they would really try to protect the bombers and the torpedo planes from uh, American planes if they were able to get up in the air. And they would try to, they would be the ones, they're the fastest, the most maneuverable, and they were the ones who would try to fight off the uh, deck guns, the anti-aircraft uh, stuff. Okay. All right, so uh, I am also going to uh, post a list called uh, Extra FYIs about the Pearl Harbor attack. So I won't necessarily do a movie about that, but I will post that so you can see that extra list and you can read that at per your leisure. How does that sound? All right, so there you go. There is your Pearl Harbor day. All right, hope you enjoyed that information.